The City Below the Cloud by T. S. Galindo Read by the Author Chapter 3 The Suit Kaylin placed a fourth pip from a fourth job on the stack in her hand, the rims magnetically aligned together to make one large cylinder. The number on the face of the top pip changed from 3,750 kilojoules to 15 megajoules. The faces were smart surfaces that raised and lowered to show the exact amount of charge contained within the small power cells, and when aligned in a stack, showed the combined charge. She gripped the stack in her hand excitedly and put it in the inner pocket of her coverall. Fifteen. I haven't gotten fifteen megajoules in one cycle in forever. It's still early, too. I can grab Set early and spend some time with her. I should get her a can of air on the way. This is going to be great. The air was fairly clear because it hadn't rained since before the first task. She unstrapped her face mask and let it hang around her neck. Even with the air as clear as it was, she had to stop herself from taking a deep breath. She needed to regulate her breathing to be slow and shallow, taking in only as much air as was necessary. She hated wearing the big heavy mask, but it was preferable to the wet shuddering coughs that developed from prolonged exposure to the acid rain. She looked up at the signs, found one pointing toward the yards where she'd meet up with Set, and started walking that way. As she did, it occurred to her that she hadn't been checking her equipment between jobs. Her excitement drained into anxiety, and her blood rushed from her head. She hastily inspected her suit. No, 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 how could I be so stupid? I always check. The jobs were quick and easy, maybe nothing happened. My arms are fine. Gloves are secure and attached. Boots too, legs good, torso okay, my side, there's a tear. She stuck her hand through a tear in the suit on her left side. Anxiety flowed into panic. She started pacing. What do I do? What do I do? How long has it been there? How did I not notice? She felt lightheaded, like she was about to pass out, but she couldn't stop pacing. Sitting down felt wrong. She had to keep moving but she didn't know where to. She ran. She ran into the first building she saw and into the stairwell. She went under the stairs on the first floor. It was somewhere to be alone without paying for a unit. She paced back and forth, breathing erratically, going back and forth between shaking her hands wildly and gripping the suit over the tear in an attempt to hold it shut. What did I do? I ruined everything. I'm going to have mushrooms growing under my back, and I'm going to die, and then Seth's going to be all alone, and then she's going to starve, and it's all my fault because I didn't just check my damn suit. What's wrong with me? How could I forget this? She paced around for a bit longer and tried to calm herself down. Stop it. Stop it. It's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but maybe it's okay. Take a look at the hole and see if there's anything there. Like what? I don't know. A mushroom growing out of my back? There wouldn't be a mushroom growing out of my back. That's stupid. Itching. That's it. When Aaron got hit with a cloud, he was itching like mad for cycles. Then he died. Stop. Just see if it itches. She stopped moving and tried to slow her breathing so she could focus all her attention on the area just under the tear. I don't feel anything. Does that mean I'm okay? How do I know? Would it already be itching or does that come later? Maybe it only itches if I scratch it first. Ugh. I don't know. Okay, stop. I don't feel anything. I'm pretty sure I checked the suit last cycle, right? Yes, yes. So I just need to sew up the suit. No. A new one. I'll get a new one, and then I'll pretend like none of this ever happened. It'll be fine. Okay. That's it. That's what I'll do. She let herself sit down for a moment. She sat against the wall under the stairs in the dark, holding her knees to her chest like she did when she was a kid. She sat and breathed. Slowly the world stopped wobbling. Her upper lip was tingly from hyperventilating, but slowly it also returned to normal. She got up, went back outside, and found a sign for a market. She numbly followed the signs through the streets until one pointed up. The markets were typically on the 50th floor, so they'd be closer for everyone no matter what floor they started on. The building had a lift attached to the outside, the cheapest way to ascend the city. There was a flat charge rate to get on, regardless of how long you rode. The cage platform spanned the entire side of a building and stuck out a quarter of the way across the street. They could move about a hundred people at once, but at a slow, 
constant speed, about one floor every 30 to 45 seconds. One had just left the ground floor. The next one would leave in five minutes, but Kaylin didn't want to wait. She couldn't wait. She had to keep moving. She jogged into the building and up to the fourth floor. She focused on a list of tasks in her head, cycling through it over and over to keep herself calm. Get to a market. Find a shop selling clothes with a scrub suit. Buy the suit. Get to the yard. Find set. Everything will be fine. Get to a market. She made her way to the lift gate. The display showed 150 jewels. She took out her small stack of pips and twisted the top one to the left. The numbers flashed back to 3,750 kilojoules and then began descending. She stopped when it got down to 200 joules. She didn't want it to take the pip in case she needed more than three to make change. She lifted the pip off the stack, which now read 14,999.8 kilojoules, and inserted it into the slot in the door jamb. The machine extracted 150 joules and dropped it back out with 50 joules on its face. She grabbed it, put it back on the stack, and walked through the turnstile. She was then standing on an open ledge while she waited for the lift gate to get up to her. She felt an updraft blow through the hole in her side and nervously grabbed it shut. Standing on the ledge reminded her of when she was little. She lived with a group of kids who'd been abandoned. Most parents kicked their kids out when they got big enough to fend for themselves. They'd run through the streets, begging for charge or looking for scraps at the yards to throw in the reclamators. Sometimes, when they found enough charge to ride the lifts, they'd ride them up to the top and drop things off the roofs. While they waited for the lift to come up to their floor, they'd dare each other to jump onto it. Whoever jumped from the highest won. There were the occasional bruises and scraped knees. One time, her friend, Tank, broke his leg going for a record. They stopped daring each other after that. Kaylin stepped onto the elevator. She looked around the platform at the various small shops. They were a patchwork of plastic sheets laid on the graded floor with assorted wares spread across them. There were two with tarps on poles to protect from the rain. They'd even sell standing room under them when the rain started. She spotted one with some air cans for sale. Since I have to buy a new scrub suit, I might not be able to get one for set, but I can at least afford one for myself to calm down. The woman running the shop sat in a crouched position, ready to jump up at any moment. She had tight, twitchy muscles stretched thin over a long, skinny, skeletal frame, and loose, leathery skin the color of smoke from an oil fire. It was the tight, efficient musculature of scarcity and chronic overexertion that most in the city shared. Her left ear was missing. In its place was a small wire cone that contorted to catch sounds in all directions, like a cat's ear. In her right hand, she held a pipe with a stun baton on the end, like a spear. The other hand was free to make transactions. A cage enclosed the lift so people couldn't just jump on at ground level. This made it harder for people to steal from the shops, but every bit of charge mattered, so the vendors always kept a close watch on their merchandise. Kaylin pointed to an air can and slowly handed her a 50 jewel pip. Without taking her eyes off Kaylin, she smeared her bony arthritic finger over the surface to verify the amount was correct. She nodded slightly. Kaylin took the can and walked to the other end of the lift. It started drizzling. She pulled her hood over her head and looked out over the side, trying to distract herself from her possible infectious demise. She eavesdropped on a transaction going on near her in one of the tented shops. A tall young man with gray marble-colored skin had a long gash on his forearm that a mender was about to treat. His other arm was prosthetic just below the elbow. The mender was about the same age, with wide, blunt facial features. She wore a one-piece work suit with the sleeves torn off for better movement. She roughly grabbed the man's wrist and tugged it under a globe to inspect the wound. She looked up at him and said, One megajoule. He replied with irritation in his voice, A whole megajoule? No way. This'll take half a tube of goo to close up. You can always walk around bleeding and try to find a better deal. It's not my problem. His tone changed to anxiety. Look, all I've got is 600 jewels, please. She held out her hand with an annoyed look on her face, said, Pay up. With his prosthetic, he reached into the pockets of his worn pair of pants and pulled out a stack of pips and handed it to her. The number read 580 jewels. She scowled up at him, then motioned to his prosthetic. How much you got in there? No, come on, I need it to work, please, he begged. She grabbed his prosthetic and ejected the pip. It read two megajoules. She replaced it with a one megajoule pip and gave him back his stack of pips. 
then gave him an extra pip with twenty jewels on it. There, now sit down. We'll fix the meaty one, she said as she got out some supplies. How did you get this? Mine? She asked while pouring water over the wound. It was deep. Kalen saw the muscle flinching through the opening in his skin. He replied between winces. Refinery. Ouch. I got too close to a crusher wheel. A piece of metal stuck on it slashed me open. She took some tape and loosely pulled the two sides of the cut together, leaving gaps of exposed muscle. Is that what happened to old Clanky too? She said snidely, nodding toward the prosthetic. No, well, yeah. It wasn't a piece of metal, though. My sleeve got caught while I was dumping a load of ore. It pulled my armor to the crusher. Same one, now I think about it. The crusher blade sliced right through. It took me ten cycles in a deep mine to get enough charge for the new arm. Then they tell me I gotta keep feeding it charge just to make it keep working. I might not have gotten it if I'd known that. Prosthetics use charge to power them, so someone would have to get extra pips to keep them running. The benefit of having a working limb usually outweighed the extra work, though. Without them, most would starve. At least it's below the elbow. Don't have to worry about charge for the joint. Probably saves you a lot, the mender commented. She picked up a small tube with a black, oily-looking substance in it. It was usually called goo or bio-goo. Kaylin didn't like the stuff. It always reminded her of the sticky ooze that dripped off the bottom of some mushrooms. She thought that's where the goo came from. It was actually made up of trillions of nanorobots. They were the key to combining biological and technological systems. Their main function was to communicate between the two. With the nanobots, a prosthetic understood the nerve impulses from the brain, and the nerves understood the digital signals from the machine. They were also capable of self-aligning. They could form a variety of shapes and densities. Their programming was such that they did whatever was necessary for whatever they were in contact with. So for a prosthetic, they would form a sort of adhesive, attaching the living cells to the prosthetic and translating between them. Another function was acting as surrogate cells, like with the cut. As the mender poured black liquid into the cut, the nanorobots attached to the cells of the skin and determined that it was trying to repair itself. Then the bots worked together to pull the skin back into the correct position, closing the cut while the new skin cells formed. The new cells would replace the nanobots. As the bots were replaced, some would fall away and some would get absorbed into the body and start floating around, doing whatever was necessary. They were small enough that they used the electromagnetic fields permeating the air to keep operating. Since the nanobots had been in use for a long time, loose spots permeated everything and everyone, but not in quantities to where they could heal a cut on their own. They had no propulsion systems, but they floated through everyone's body doing random tasks to help. They supplemented the immune system and fought infections, which kept the city from succumbing to catastrophic outbreaks. Halen watched the bio goop pull the sides of the cut together while the mender pulled the tape off and said, There you go. You'll be fine in a few cycles. Maybe think about looking for a new job. They're all dangerous, but this one doesn't seem to like you. The man cradled his freshly fixed arm, thanked her, and walked away, ignoring her comment about finding more agreeable work. Kaylin decided to use the filtered air can while she waited for her floor. The cans were the only respite from the acrid taste of the rainy street air. She put the mouthpiece around her nose and mouth and inhaled deeply while pressing the release button. It felt like every cell in her lungs were bursting at once. She dropped the can and started coughing violently, collapsing to the floor on her hands and knees. Her vision went dark from the effort and lack of oxygen. The coughing fit grew until she vomited, which calmed the convulsions but her body was shaking from the exertion. Her vision started coming back in pulses with her heartbeat. As things came back into focus, she saw the gridded floor in front of her, and there in the vomit she'd just produced, she saw several small mushrooms and other fungal material. This sent her into a full panic. She scrambled backward across the floor, then got up and ran to the other end of the platform, bracing herself against the cage wall nearest the building. She wanted to get off the lift as quickly as possible. Catching her breath, she looked up to see everyone staring at her, including a familiar form. At the opposite corner of the platform stood the creek. She refused to wait any longer for the lift. She climbed the cage and pulled herself up onto the next level and ran through the exit gate into the building. As she did, she looked back to see the creek moving toward the building after her. She ran as fast as she could, her lungs still burning from the violent upheaval, up the last few flights of stairs to the 50th floor. She made her way outside onto a walkway and followed the signs to the market. She didn't stop running. She couldn't stop running. 
her panic wouldn't let her again, no matter how much her lungs begged her to. She didn't know what the creep wanted with her, but she knew it wouldn't be good, and she wanted to get as far away from the mess she made on the platform as possible. She made her way into the market hall. The entire floor of the building was one large room, with tents and shops set up in no discernible order. She made her way toward the middle, away from entrances where the creep might come in if they were still following her. She kept moving, keeping an eye on the doors, moving through the aisles of tents, using them to hide. After twenty minutes without seeing them, she decided it was safe. After another thirty minutes of searching, she saw a scrub suit hanging in the back of a tent with a large older man sitting on a stool at its entrance. He had an unkempt white beard and dark, almost black skin with age spots a few shades lighter. There was a big grin on his face, showing his incomplete set of teeth. He wore an old pair of brown pants and a long, sleeveless tunic. His right arm was prosthetic all the way up to the shoulder. It reached up over his neck and wrapped around his ribs, just under his chest. It was a much more complicated model than the one the man on the lift had. The end of it, where his hand would be, had what looked like a sewing machine attached to it. He wore it in a sling. Halen thought it might be to cut down on the amount of charge he'd have to feed it. The seller saw she was interested in his scrub suit since she was wearing one herself, and because she was staring right at it. The big man waved at her, calling her over. Hey, friend, come over. Try it out. It's the only one on this floor, can you imagine? Name's old Jim, on account of me being old. And Jim, ha. <laughs> I, I got a tear in mind. I need a new one. How much is it? Just a tear? I can sew that up for you, no problem. Two hundred jewels, the vendor said with his big grin while brandishing his sewing hand up like a trophy. Cave in down in the mine. Took out me whole arm. I was trapped for half a cycle, can you imagine? They just kept digging around me. Thought I was dead on account of me not saying nothing. I'd been knocked out, you see. Finally I came to and they decided to help, as long as they gotta keep any ore they found on top of me. Can you imagine that? Anyway, I got this off a guy at the salvage yard. Great deal, too. Of course, it was because it barely holds its own weight. He didn't tell me that part, though. I had to find out on me own when I gooed the thing to me shoulder. Ha! <laughs> well, it all worked out fine, because I just tied it up in this old sling, and hey, it came with a new job. Now I can sew anything. Better than getting buried in the mine, eh? He said it was an old med -cal arm from when they used to sew people clothes like a pair of pants. Can you imagine that? People walking around with string in them like some kind of doll? Oh, I guess they didn't always have that goo stuff, though, huh? Here, let me take a look at that tear. Halen stood, stunned by the man's explosion of a personality, then uttered shakily, Uh, no, no, I'd rather have a new one. I don't want to just patch this one. Really, thank you, but how much for the new one? Is it okay? Does it have any holes or anything? Old Jim's energy dropped a tad. Nah, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It'll be a lot more expensive, though. His grin faded a bit as he looked Kalen over, trying to decide what to ask for. Then, with a bit of a glint in his eye, he said, I'll tell you what, how's about you give me that old suit and two megajoules, and that little old tooth you got hanging around your neck? I forgot about the tooth. I guess it's probably not worth anything, and I really need that suit. He's acting funny, though. Sure, here you go, she said, taking off the tooth and handing him a two megajoule pip with it. Old Jim took the payment, then reached behind and grabbed the new suit. Kalen took it and thoroughly inspected it before changing into it. Nice job doing business with you. Come again. Ha. <laughs> Kalen felt his laugh had a sinister hint in it now. She wondered if she'd just been deceived. I needed this suit, though. There was nothing else I could have done. It's over now. I'm safe. I still have enough charge for a unit, so that's good. At least this cycle's almost over. She left the market and made her way to the yards to pick up Seth.